Thank you very much, Francesco, for a kind introduction. Uh, well, the first talk is about um, the anatomy of the retroperitoneum. Um, of course, you all know they have retroperitoneal organs, e.g. kidneys, adrenal glands. Uh, we have the greater vessels. But what is really crucial about imaging of the retroperitoneal structures is understanding its layered structure. Um, basically, it means planes and spaces. And understanding anatomy lies in understanding embryology. Um, I'd like to say some few words here. It's um, the, the uh, retroperitoneal space is there because the kidneys origin in the pelvic space and then ascend into uh, the superior parts. And then this is many formed by the primary retroperitoneal spaces. And then we have the rotation of the foregut and gut structures that form the uh, different other layers. Um, unfortunately, to go through the embryology would take at least 45 minutes, but it's fascinating and I really encourage you to may go back to a textbook and uh, study those embryological movements. However, how does it look like? We have a classical compartment model um, that divides the retroperitoneum into three main spaces, which is the perinephric spaces, the anterior pararenal space, and the two posterior pararenal spaces. Um, we have some extra peritoneal spaces in the pelvic area that are more complex uh, because some abdominal pararenal spaces continue into the pelvis. However, uh, which is mostly true, not always, is what I like to mention that perinephric spaces are confined to the abdomen. Um, let me start with the perirenal spaces. They are the largest retroperitoneal spaces. The contents are the kidneys, adrenal glands, the proximal ureters, and perirenal fat, of course. Um, the right and left spaces communicate inferiorly, and they are delimited by the renal fasture, which is a well-defined anterior component is called the gyrotus fascia or anterior renal fascia. We have a thinner posterior component. Uh, in the American uh, um, area, it's often named as Zucker candles fascia, or more European style would be the posterior renal fascia. How does it look like? Uh, we have these spaces here. Um, the pararenal spaces over here, and here's the anterior renal fascia. And let me go back. And here's the posterior one over here. And here we have a communication area where those bosses can communicate. Um, the anterior pararenal space is a single space anterior to the perinephric spaces. It content contents the pancreas, parts of the pancreas, portions of the duodenum, aorta, inferior vena cava, and parts of the ascending and descending colon. The anterior boundary is the posterior pararenal uh, peritoneum, and its posterior boundary is the anterior renal fascia, also known as the rotus fascia, as I mentioned before. It's like this space over here. Um, the last space, which is quite small, is the posterior pararenal spaces. Um, they are the right and left spaces posterior and lateral to the perinephric spaces. Its contents are mostly fat, um, also cause, uh, called um, um, pre-peritoneal fat, and its anterior boundary consists of the posterior renal fascia and the lateral coronal fascia. Its posterior boundary is the transversal fascia. To show it to you, it's like this space over, over here. And it stands to the anterior part and to the flanks of uh, the, the body. And um, my talk is basically about anatomy, but uh, just to keep that in your minds, what these posterior uh, power in the spaces do. Actually, if you have a pancreatitis, hemorrhage, or 
enzymes from the pancreas can ascend through those posterior pararenal spaces and cause this sign called Gray Turner sign, which are these hemorrhagic bleedings here in the flank of the patient. This is actually because the fluid can go into the posterior pararenal spaces. Um, let's continue with the pararenal space. Um, the kit, there's also fat and the kidneys. Actually, the kidneys um, have to be like a little bit more fixated um, in order not to freely move in those space. And this is done by uh, some septae that is called bridging septae. There are different ones. There are ones that connect the uh, anterior fascia with the kidney. There are some within the fat or some connect the anterior and the posterior uh, fascia together. So it is kind of a network in there, in the fat, in order to um, co control the movements of the kidneys. Um, usually you don't see those structures, but if you have patients with ascites or in cases, uh, in cases with pancreatitis, you may see those fluid collections along those septae, and then you can delineate those structures. So you may have in patients with pancreatitis or ascites, you may look for those structures. These are the normal bridging septa, which are now attenuated by the fluid. We can use, um, uh, we have the spaces defined, and we can moreover define uh, also planes. Uh, important plane structures are the uh, retromesenteric plane, the lateral conal plane, and the retorenal plane. Um, these structures are important because they serve as leading structures for processes uh, that spread along those structures. In this case, there's a, a fluid distribution along those structures, but also in malign processes, you have the structures that can um, serve as areas for spreading. Um, there's the interfacial plane, um, which is, can be defined as a fusion between the anterior and the posterior part of the uh, renal fascia over here, or the girota on the sacrocandal fascia. And those structures fuse in the inferior parts of um, the, the planes and form a structure called interfacial plane. Um, this plane is also important because this plane can serve also as a, a leading structure for spreading of diseases. And here we have the right side. Um, usually, um, the fusion part is over here, but we have um, an anterior part where the bare area on the liver is, where there's a kind of a hole, and through this hole, uh, there's a communication possibility between retroperitoneal and peritoneal structures. So this is the idea of an interfacial uh, plane, which, is, which more serves to a multi-layer concept of the retroperitoneum uh, instead of a unilayer concept that is ideally uh, formed by the ideas of the embryology. On the left side, uh, we also see those structures here. We have an anterior and posterior fusion. Um, here are the both structures, um, and here we have a fusion point where the anterior and posterior fascia fuse and also fuse with the lateral coronal uh, plane. Where those structures fuse with the retromesenteric plane, uh, we have a part that's called facial trifurcation because those three planes fuse there. And this is also a, a part and, and a lands, landmark for um, spreading fluid along. And uh, you might see here we have a fluid collection that uh, is along those uh, planes. Moreover, uh, the structure can serve for the spread of different diseases like tuberculosis um, via the quadratus lumborum muscle. As you may see here, um, this is um, the um, posterior or the inferior part of the fusion here on both sides. And in cases of 
e.g. a pancreatitis, you say, may see here the spread of fluid along those junctions of the planes. In fact, there is a uh, model that classifies um, the pancreatitis level of severeness according to the spread through the different planes. Um, this may, may uh, serve as a surrogate markers in, in patients that don't need contrast media um, for the uh, severe index of pancreatitis. Um, I chose this, this image um, to uh, illustrate the value of MRI. Here we have on the left side um, an, a coronal haste uh, of a patient and the advantage of MRI is we can easily depict fluids because they're so high intense on T2 weighted imaging. Um, so if you're looking for tiny fluids, fluid collections into a patient, you may use a MRI and you can see those um, structures, fluid collections along those structures. In this case, also along the interfacial plane. Um, the next part would be um, about the imaging modalities. We have, of course, of course ultrasound, we have CT, we have MRI, uh, we have PET, which I uh, will exclusively or sought to the uh, imaging of cancer diseases. Um, concerning ultrasound, we have some really good pro points for that. It's robust, it's fast and easy to access. Um, the best patient for that would be trauma patients who come into the emergency room. Uh, we have immobile patients who are so ill uh, that you can't uh, transfer them into a MRI or CT scanner. Um, we can easily depict fluid collections with um, uh, ultrasound, at least in some parts that can be reached uh, um, adequately, like the Morrison pouch, for example. Ultrasound is good for kidney imaging and structures of fluids surrounding the kidneys. And we can use it for um, drainage guiding, image guided drainages of abscess or fluid collections. The problem is for retroperitoneum, uh, we have in a lot of cases, we have bowel air that um, serves as, as a border for um, the ultrasound, so we cannot uh, see beyond that. And ultrasound doesn't deliver a global assessment of the retroperitoneal structures. So this is why CT comes into play. Um, CT is the most common used modality, of course, for retroperitoneal structures or abdominal, abdominal imaging at all. It's robust, it's fast, which is good for patients in cases of traumas, acute traumas, or also severe ill patients who cannot stand the procedures for longer than like five minutes. It has a high spatial resolution, and uh, for retroperitoneum, the most important part here is that you can perform 3D reconstructions. And um, to see those facial planes I described uh, earlier, it is uh, mandatory that you look into 3D to those structures. So um, I usually perform a transversal axle, a coron, and sagittal reconstruction of uh, those uh, uh, retroperitoneal parts. Uh, the con is, of course, the radiation exposure, which is almost important in children. So I proceed to the MRI imaging. The pros are, of course, the um, soft tissue resolution. Um, we can perform fluid attenuated sequences, T2-weighted images, where fluids are very well depicted, as I described uh, earlier. We have no radiation exposure. And what is most sexy about MRI, in my opinion now, is the ability to have functional imaging with, um, uh, like, let's say, for example, diffusion-weighted imaging, which uh, makes it really easier to assess peritoneal carcinomatosis or lymphatic metastatic disease. The cons are, of course, the time. Um, you can put severe ill patients, e.g. with an acute pancreatitis, into an MRI for 45 minutes. 
uh, we have motion artifacts. And those motion artifacts can uh, result in a lower image quality of um, our imaging. Um, and this is connected also with the susceptibility artifacts by air into the bowel structures. So, um, how would look? Uh, how would an imaging protocol of CT look like? Uh, this is how we would do it. Actually, um, we have a patient preparation. Um, if it's possible, we would recommend to give a negative oral contrast medium, usually water. There's some patients, e.g., pancreatitis, who can't stand drinking so much water. Um, but at least for other indications, a negative oral contrast agent is uh, very helpful. Uh, because of the bowel movement, we recommend using an antiparasitic drug, e.g., uh, buscopane or um, glucagon. Um, we use a contrast media, of course, like. Um, a standard dose of 100 to 120 milliliters uh, of iodine contrast media. We acquired in an arterial and portal venous phase. You can add an, a naive phase before that. Um, that's not mandatory. Important is to have an adequate slice, slice thickness, which means uh, for the arterial phase we use a um, resolution of three millimeters of slice thickness. Uh, for the portal venous phase, we, lose, we use five millimeters. And we use an, another one uh, which we use for the coronal and sagittal reconstructions, which is um, 0 0.75 or up to one millimeter isotropic. And those isotropic um, images. Um, help you really um, to acquire a good imaging of the uh, retroperitoneal structures by these coronal and sagittal reconstructions. Um, for the MRI imaging protocol, we uh, perform the examination in a supine position. Of course, we use a phased air recall to uh, increase SNR. Uh, in imaging of uh, patients with MRI and abdominal imaging, using an antiparasitic drug is even more mandatory because of the bowel motions that um, interferes um, significantly more uh, with our images than compared to CT imaging. Um, we use all three planes, um, axial, coronal, and sagittal um, uh, planes, the sagittal ones, are good to uh, delineate the spreading of disease from uh, inferior or uh, uh, superior to inferior structures. Um, important is a combination between breath hold and breathing independent sequences. Um, we use um, a T1 weighted um, spoiled gradient echo sequence with in phase and out of phase imaging, a 3D gradient echo imaging that allows for sagittal reconstruction also, if necessary. Uh, of course, a T1 fat set um, spoiled gradient echo sequence after contrast media application. Otherwise, you can use a 3D T1 weighted gradient echo sequence also fat suppressed. That allows also 3D reconstruction after acquiring the sequence in all uh, different planes. Concerning the fluids, it's important to have a T2 weighted imaging. Um, usually, you should use fast uh, spin echo train imaging. Um, concerning your know, Philips and, and G, it's FSE. Uh, in Siemens uh, nomenclature, it's TSE, turbo spin echo sequences. And for a robust imaging of abdom, always the stir imaging is very good because it's robust, it's easy to perform, and it shows you where are fluid collections in the abdomen. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, for functional imaging, which is kind of the new kit on the block uh, on MRI imaging, we recommend doing a, um, a di diffusion weighted image with an EPI sequence using at least two B values, um, a low B value between 
0 and 50, and a high B value between 600 and 1000, depending on the device you have. In some cases, uh, it goes to 600 with adequate um, image quality. In newer scanners, you can go up to 1000. Uh, let's sum up uh, before I come to the questions. Um, there are three main spaces. Important of imaging of retroperitoneal structures and planes is understanding its layered structures. I always recommend going back to embryology. Um, there are some decompression slots where fluids can communicate between those planes and extend, um, e.g., from retro to interperitoneal. Um, fluid imaging is therefore crucial to um, uh, disease assessment. And uh, usually the best imaging structures, most robust is CT. MRI, of course, has some advantages. Ultrasound is very good for first quick assessment of uh, those diseases. So I would go to the um, first question. So remember that you have to connect, remember, excuse me. Remember that you have to connect uh, not to the main Wi-Fi system of the Congress, but with the new WLAN uh, guest to connect to the voting uh, electronic system of ECR. And uh, uh, here are the instructions. And remember, you have 15 seconds about to give us uh, the answer. And uh, we can try to start with the first question. Yeah, I can't see the envelope in here, but um, so you, you can you can read it on your own. Uh, which of the following statement is correct? So there's only one question. Is true. Okay, there are 20, 24 votes, 31, 41. <laughs> 82, okay, 87. <coughs> we can. can we see the results? Yeah, let's go to the results. Okay, um, this looks like a classic uh, Fibonacci uh, distribution. Um, um, D is right, as I explained, that functional imaging is useful for assessment of retroperitoneal diseases, especially in cancer imaging. Um, um, the, the, about the saturated plane, there's, there can be some discussion. Maybe uh, you say you don't need it in any, any case, but if you have the feeling that uh, you don't have full assessment of the disease or you're not quite sure if there's something or not, I really recommend to go for saturated uh, um, extra imaging or reconstruction of the retroperitoneum. It really can help you. Um, and the problem with 3T uh, being not superior to 1.5 Tesla is that the stronger, the higher the field strength is, the more susceptibility you have. So that's, that's why abdominal imaging at 3T is so, so difficult compared to 1.5. So 1.5 is much more robust concerning uh, bowel imaging because you don't have that much susceptibility artifacts. The industry tries to, to solve that problem, but actually 1.5 for those two things is better or more robust. So we may proceed to the next question. So what space or structures is not retroperitoneal?
So we may go to the um, answers. Yeah, that was more clearer. Um, the paracolic space is, is a kind of secondary. It's, it belongs more to the interperitoneal structures. The other ones are all true retroperitoneal um, structures. But however, because of the communications, you can have fluid collections within the paracolic space in patients with acute pancreatitis too, because there's the, the connection link through the interfacial planes from re to true intraperitoneal structures. So, the last question, please. As I mentioned, the interfacial spread, which is not correct. Um, this was the most uh, difficult one. Um, of course, it can involve the retro mesenteric plane because it's a part or can a part of the interfacial plane. Um, of course, retro renal interfacial plane are included. Um, uh, the main point is, which is uh, um, uh, not correct, is it can include um, pelvic structures because there are some some gaps where disease can spread into the pelvic area. And uh, in cases of tuberculosis or pancreatitis, uh, you have to mention that. Because, but the junction to the pelvic areas goes along the interfacial plane. Um, not much often, but you have to keep that in mind. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So I think that, that we have uh, about three minutes uh, for some question from the audience. No, no question. Um, I have a question. Uh, when you told us that the fascial planes can be thickness or expanded by fluid, that means that the primitive adhesion can be opened by the fluid. And if this is true, it means that the fascial planes can open into the peritoneal cavity. That's the question. I don't know if they can open, but they can communicate, right? Because of those um, gaps that are within those spaces. Um, th that's, I think, because um, it's a multi-layer concept. And because of those multi-layers, they can really open. If there, there would be just a unilayer, there couldn't be any gaps, or, or you can open, actually. But the newer theory is that there are multi-layers, and so they can open. and there is a communication to the uh, peritoneum. So I think it's correct to use uh, no more the term fascia, but fascial planes, yeah. because the fascia is two layers. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. Um, no other question? When? Yeah, actually, yeah, that's, that's, that's a double multi-layer concept. And, and these are the gaps where fluid can go in and, and also spread or other disease like in vitro peritoneal carcinosis. But I think that during the lecture, uh, one of the main message is that if you uh, want to understand exactly 
how the anatomy of the retroperitoneum develops in the adult, you have to go back to the embryology. And this is, uh, uh, there you can find the key to understand how it ap appears, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well.